Okay, we're going to write a balanced chemical equation including the states of matter for the reaction that's shown in the diagram. We've got two hydrogen gas molecules, one oxygen gas, and we're producing two water vapor. They want us to use the table in the back of the book to calculate the change in entropy and change in enthalpy for the reaction. So for the change in enthalpy, it's gonna take the coefficient on the water, which is two times 241.82, and then we're gonna subtract the enthalpies for the reactant. So I've got two H2 and that enthalpy value is zero plus O2s is also zero. So this is going to end up being negative 483.64 kilojoules per mole. Then for the change in entropy, we're going to follow the same thing. I've got two waters, so it's 2 times 188. Let's erase this. So there's my product. And then minus the reactants, so this is going to be 2 times 130 for the H2 plus 205.14 for the O2, and your delta S will be negative 88.84 kilojoules per mole. And it says, number three, what is the function of the candle in this process? Well, the candle is supplying some heat energy to get this reaction to go. So it's actually helping us overcome the activation energy For this process. Now, is this a spontaneous process um, that is enthalpy driven or entropy driven? This is enthalpy driven because we're absorbing heat energy. Now, let's talk about free energy and how enthalpy and entropy um, kind of play a role. So, there are two factors, enthalpy and entropy, and these determine whether or not a physical or a chemical process is spontaneous or favorable thermodynamically. And sometimes these two things work together. And um, for instance, if a stone wall crumbles, the enthalpy decreases, but the entropy increases. So if there's a decrease in enthalpy, but an increase in entropy, both would favor a spontaneous change. So that means they work with each other. Now, in other situations, enthalpy and entropy will be in opposing situations, like if ice is melting. Now, when enthalpy and entropy effects oppose each other, the overall reaction spontaneity is less obvious. So we can determine the net effect of um, enthalpy and entropy by using a thermodynamic quantity called Gibbs free energy, which is labeled a capital G. This is named after... Um, uh, scientists in the U.S. in the late 1800s by the name of Gibbs. His equation is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So for a chemical or physical change at constant temperature and pressure, then that's what you get for the equation. Now, let's take a look at the top of the next page. A change is spontaneous if it's accompanied by a decrease in free energy. So that means your delta G has to be negative for a spontaneous change. And spontaneous changes are also referred to as being thermodynamically favorable changes. Okay, And um, we have a table that shows the effects of the positive and negative values for delta H and delta S on delta G. Um, and Temperature can be really important in some of these instances. And what I would recommend you do is I would definitely know um, this table. I would know if the delta H value is a certain sign and the delta S value is a certain sign, then your delta G should be a certain sign. And then I would know the reaction characteristics. I would not memorize this in terms of the examples. But if you go back and you put these values into this equation, like the signs, 
then you will see how they are coming up with the delta G signs and the reaction characteristics, okay? Now, reactions that occur with a free energy decrease, so that means G is going down, that means they are exergonic, and then those that occur with a free energy increase, that means G is increasing, then they are endergonic. And this is shown here in the figure, so here is my negative delta G spontaneous process. You can see that the free energy is decreasing as the reactants are being converted into products. On the right-hand side for your endergonic reaction where your delta G is greater than zero, this is a non-spontaneous process where converting reactants to products results in an increase in free energy. Now, um, I think... We can turn to the next page. Let's go here, talk about free energy and maximum work. So um, the maximum amount of energy that we can actually harness from a reaction as work is delta G. So that means this is the energy that is not lost as heat and therefore free or available for us to use to do work, okay? And reactions that have negative free energy changes are spontaneous. That means they are thermodynamically favorable. And those with positive free energy changes are non-spontaneous, which means the reverse reaction is spontaneous, okay? And when the value of delta G is zero, the reaction is at equilibrium, okay? And let's come down here. Okay. Um, at equilibrium, since delta H, wrong, let's fix that. At equilibrium, since delta H equals temperature times the change in entropy, that means you would get this equation. And um, if you know delta H and delta S, then you can calculate temperature at which equilibrium will occur. So I would highlight this so that you can make a reference to using this um, for the temperature at which equilibrium occurs. And this is the temperature at which a state change occurs. Okay. Now let's take a look at the quick check. Number one, we have a certain process with the delta H and delta S values. Explain why a positive value for the enthalpy change is reasonable for this process. Well, here we're converting liquid into gas, so this is vaporization. So vaporizing requires heat energy. So that means this would be absorbing heat. It would be endothermic. And that's why we would have a positive delta H, okay? B says, why would we expect the entropy change to be positive for this process? Well, the bromine particles will have more random um, motion in space because it's converting into a gas. And so since there are more microstates, remember W means microstates, that means you would have a positive change in entropy. C, assuming that delta H and delta S are temperature independent, calculate the temperature at which liquid bromine will be in equilibrium with gaseous bromine and give the answer in degrees Celsius. Okay, so if we use the equation up above where we had um, the temperature is equal to the delta H divided by delta S, I just rearranged it, then you're going to take your delta H, which is 31.0 kilojoules per mole. And then I'm going to go ahead and convert the kilojoules into joules. And then we need to divide this by the entropy, which is 92.9 joules, because I need the units to match. So, and that's per mole. So this would be per mole and then 92.9 joules here on the bottom. Joules will cancel, and then um, we're going to end up getting 334 Kelvin. This is mole times Kelvin. 
these cancel as well. And then we need to convert this over by subtracting 273, so you're going to get 60 degrees Celsius. And what property does this temperature represent for bromine? Well, if we're showing where liquid bromine is in equilibrium with gaseous bromine, this is actually going to be the boiling point for that liquid. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at the next page. So around the time that Gibbs derived his free energy equation, there was a German physicist called Helmholtz that deduced the same thing. So this is why the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation is a common name for delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Okay, you will often hear people refer to the equation as that. And that equation works at all temperatures, pressures, and concentrations. But if we're looking at standard conditions, standard conditions would be a pressure of one atmosphere, a concentration of one molarity, if it applies. You're going to get this equation here. So the standard free energy change, that little degree symbol means standard, and um, equals the standard enthalpy change which we calculate from the reference values in the back of the book, and then minus T, which is temperature in Kelvin, times delta S. Um, that's the standard entropy change calculated from the reference values in the back of the book as well. And um, there is a graph that shows you energy versus temperature and the difference between enthalpy and free energy and TS. So what this shows you is that as the temperature increases the difference between these two forms of energy becomes larger. Now, since enthalpy and entropy are state functions, and you definitely want to know this, it makes sense that Gibbs free energy is also a state function, and we can use Hess's law to calculate the standard free energies from the table in the back of the book. So it's the sum of the free energy of the products minus the sum of the free energy of the reactants, and if there's coefficients, you multiply those standard values by their coefficients. Now, you should make a note that if Gibbs free energy is zero for an element in its normal state, that means we're at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere pressure. So let's take a look at the next page before we do some practice problems. Um, I would definitely understand how this figure is relating spontaneous and non-spontaneous reactions um, based upon your standard entropy and enthalpy values. Um, so I'm just making that note. And then let's turn to the practice problems on the next page. Okay, so here what we're doing is we're going to use the values in the back of the book to calculate the Gibbs free energy. And um, I'm going to stop this video and start a new one.